As art forms go, cinema is among the most diverse when it comes to its uses. From mainstream popcorn blockbusters that entertain us, to avant-garde art film for self-expression, to documentaries that broaden our horizons, cinema can be used in so many different ways for so many different ends. Something that cinema is particularly suited to is the exploration of philosophical ideas and the presentation of arguments. And it's this that makes Fritz Lang's first sound picture, 1931's M, such an astonishing piece of film. M was one of the first films to explore sound as a means of advancing the story. It laid the groundwork for the modern thriller, and its innovative use of light and shadow informed the look of film noir. But above all else, it represents a shift in cinema towards more complex and nuanced film. It lays the groundwork of a carefully constructed moral and philosophical question, one to which the audience is expected to draw their own conclusion and examine their own moral beliefs. But how does Fritz Lang use film to ask us a question? Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at at least one film each year from 1915 onwards to track the evolution of film over the last century. Some of the earliest films explore philosophical concepts, but M was one of the first films that was structured deliberately to ask a question to the audience. If you look at the structure of a written argumentative essay, you typically get something like this. An introduction where you state what you'll be arguing, your evidence where you lay out your premises and say why what you're saying is true, and a conclusion where you arrive at a hypothesis based on your evidence. Arguments made through film operate in the same way, but the language of cinema isn't words and prose. Arguments are constructed through shots, blocking, acting, editing, and montage. You can see this basic structure in Fritz Lang's earlier masterpiece, Metropolis. The introduction questions the extreme divide between two sections of a futuristic society. For our evidence, we explore the world and the lives of the people in it, and we arrive at the conclusion that there needs to be closer cooperation between the two classes. Let's examine M. What is Lang trying to argue, and how does he go about it? The first thing to note is that M is structured slightly different to a traditional long-form argument. M introduces the argument and supplies the evidence, but the film never reaches a conclusion. Instead, the audience is left to write their own conclusion to the argument, and in that way, Lang asks us to examine a philosophical question. Lang hits us with the introduction to his argument immediately. The first few minutes of the film tell us almost everything we need to know. A child killer is terrorizing the city, children sing songs about him, and frantic parents worry over the safety of their children. The shot of the soon-to-be-killed Elsie Beckman being helped across the road lets us know that in this society, they normally care for their most vulnerable. The image is starkly contrasted by the shadow of a murderer across his own wanted poster, listing his horrific crimes. Question. How do we react to a child killer loose in the city? The benefit of the medium of film is that the filmmaker can give the audience almost complete omnipotence, allowing them to examine the evidence from all angles. Lang shows us the effects that this string of murders is having on the town. Suspicion and tension builds till innocent people turn on each other. We see how it affects the parents, the public, the police, and organized crime. We hear a psychologist analyse the handwriting of Hans Beckett, determining it to show clear signs of insanity, while at the same time we see Beckett playfully stretching the sides of his mouth to amuse himself in a mirror. This same image is shown to us again as he catches a glimpse of a child and tries to suppress the urges inside him. We hear a reoccurring motif of In the Hall of the Mountain King as whistled by Hans Beckett before he kills. The childlike, almost joyful tune is the exact opposite of what's about to happen, adding an extra layer of sadism to an already despicable crime. But as we hear the tune more and more, it becomes clear that it's not being whistled out of pleasure, but out of compulsion, an externalization of an inner, uncontrollable urge. Lang stops short of making Beckett likeable, but he helps us understand him by showing the world that he inhabits. We see him struggle to contain himself. We see him scared and alone, but we never feel sympathy for him because at the same time, we see the effects of Beckett's crime, heartbroken parents and a town torn apart by fear and paranoia. In the final scenes of the film, Beckett is caught by the mob and is taken to an underground trial. We hear the townspeople and the prosecutor, the accused and his defense. The court maintains that Beckett must be killed, 
To let him live is to risk him killing again. Beckett argues that the murders are beyond his control and he isn't responsible for his actions. Just as the crowd is about to kill Beckett, the police arrive and take him to a real court. But before the judge can give his verdict, the film fades to black and ends, leaving the audience to be the final judge in this case, using the evidence presented to them throughout the film to come to their decision. Exhibit A, Beckett is a child killer. Exhibit B, Beckett is unable to control his actions. Exhibit C, if left alive, there is a chance he could return to the streets to kill again. The question you must ask yourself is, is it right to kill a man, even one as abhorrent as a child murderer, if he doesn't have control over his actions? The question has roots in utilitarianism, the idea that the best action is normally the one that benefits the largest group of people. It was first put into words by philosopher Jeremy Bentham in the early 1800s, but its roots go back much further than that. If you examine the context within which the film was made, Germany, 1931, the question takes on a deeper meaning. At the time, the Nazi party were the second largest party in the Reichstag. Their dangerous, far-right ideology called for the subjugation and eventual extermination of minority groups for the ostensible benefit of the majority Aryan Germans. Fritz Lang and Peter Lorre, both Jewish, eventually fled Germany in 1934. Viewed through this historical context, the question is representative of a larger problem. What are we willing to sacrifice in order to ensure the greatest good for the greatest number of people? Of course, choosing to kill Beckett doesn't make you a Nazi, but the question allows you to think. If you were given the chance, how would you structure society? The reason the film is so pertinent is that it asks a question that's still relevant today. It's a question with no clear answer, and depending on what you think, it will change your politics, your personality, and the decisions that you make every day. We didn't know the answer when Jeremy Bentham first proposed utilitarianism in the 1800s. We didn't know the answer when Fritz Lang asked in 1931, and we still don't know the answer more than 70 years later. What do you think? Hey, thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema. My name's Charlie. I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that supports me on Patreon, especially my three latest supporters, that's Jeff, Avra and Marcus. Thank you so much, your support really does mean a lot. If you'd also like to help me out, you can find my Patreon page by clicking this button just here. Let me know in the comments below what you think about some of the questions raised by M, and if you want to learn more about the film and its place in cinema history, I've made a playlist of two excellent YouTubers, Mr Nerdista and Jack's Movie Reviews, you'll find that just here. And if you want to watch more of my videos, you'll find a playlist just here. Please share this video and subscribe and stay tuned for next time where we'll be talking about three films from 1932. Thank you very much.